The type of ordination we did last time, non-metric multidimensional scaling, was an unconstrained ordination, meaning that it's carried out on a single data set with the objective of identifying patterns in your data and which variables are responsible for those patterns. You can then use the outcome of that ordination in a second analysis, a second step, um, if you have an additional data set on environmental variables. And you can look at the influence of those environmental variables on your original ordination. A constrained ordination, however, uses environmental variables in the construction of an ordination um, in a simultaneous approach rather than a two-step approach. So you're making use of both a site by species data set and a site by environment data set at the same time um, as opposed to um, the two-step process that we did, um, for example, in the lesson on um, PCA and RDA. So these constrained approaches are called constrained because the, um, the thinking is that the positions of the samples in the ordination are constrained by environmental variables. Canonical correspondence analysis, or CCA, is one of the most commonly used forms of constrained ordination. Do not confuse it with correspondence analysis, which is an unconstrained type of ordination. It gets very confusing. There's also detrended correspondence analysis. So keep your names um, straight on this. Today we're doing canonical correspondence analysis. So we will have covered PCA, which is unconstrained, RDA, which is constrained, NMDS, which is unconstrained, and today CCA, which is constrained. So two unconstrained, two constrained in this class. The difference between the two choices in each type of ordination is in whether you think there's a linear response of species to environmental variables at your sites or a unimodal one. PCA and RDA are suitable if you think the response is linear. NMDS and CCA are your go-tos if the response is unimodal. So in CCA, you start with a chi-square distance matrix. And then what occurs is you regress the differences from expectations on environmental variables in order to get your fitted values, and then use a weighted regression where the total abundance of species by sites is used as the weights in the weighted regression. You then calculate the Euclidean distance of the fitted data matrix and project it by eigenanalysis, creating a triplot where you've got your three forms of data, your sites, your species, and environmental variables all plotted simultaneously. You then assess the importance of the environmental variables by correlation to the projected um, scatter diagram, the, the ordination plot, or the triplot. In terms of data assumptions and limitations for CCA, it assumes that your data are multivariate, um, normally distributed, although it does handle skew um, quite well. However, if your dependent variables are quite skewed, um, it might be preferable to transform them via square root or logarithmic um, transformation first. Um, what this does is it can prevent a few large data values from dominating a variable's contribution. Um, it assumes homogeneity of variances and a unimodal or bell-shaped uh, response between environmental variables and species composition as opposed to a linear one. A unimodal response um, distribution is most likely when you have large enough environmental gradients such that you have samples from areas that are both suitable environmental conditions for your species and unsuitable environmental conditions for your species. CCA handles um, variables that are um, exhibit multicollinearity that are correlated with each other. But on the flip side, it overemphasizes rare species and tends to underemphasize the contributions of very abundant ones.
So to work through an example of this, we're going to use the CCA function from package vegan. And we're going to use the Bryce vegetation and um, Bryce site data sets. And in Bryce site, the site by environment data set, um, this shows the environmental variables present. And what you should do is you could you should select those variables that you think are important to analyze as predictors or constraining variables. In the example in the online notes that I worked through, I selected um, aspect value, elevation, and slope as the variables that I believe um, drive plant community composition in Bryce Canyon. The choice of which variables you include in your CCA or any other form of constrained ordination will have um, a great influence on the outcome that you get. If you have variables that are correlated with each other, then including all of them will bias your outcome due to overfitting. So what you should do is only include variables that you think are the most important independent predict predictors or determinants of species composition. If you have at least as many variables as you have samples in your CCA, then your ordination is no longer constrained and you will have explained 100% of the variation in species composition, but due to overfitting. In such cases, you really ought to perform an unconstrained ordination first to identify the most important independent variables and then use those axes in your CCA, kind of like we did with the PCA RDA lesson. We use PCA to simplify a large data set and then use those axes as dependent variables in the RDA. Okay, so in our case, anyway, um, these are the three independent predictor variables that I think are going to drive vegetation in um, Bryce Canyon National Park. So, do the the CCA, and this is the output that you get. Okay, so, so let's examine this. First off, we have a column of inertia, and we've got total inertia, or um, the variability that could be explained in your data, the constrained uh, amount of variability that is explained by your CCA, and then the unconstrained, which is um, the unexplained variance. So in this example, um, the CCA was not very informative because what you do is you take the constrained variance and divide it by the total variance. And in that case, uh, in this uh, particular example, the answer comes out to be um, 0.0642 or 6.42% of the total variability was captured or explained by the CCA. That ratio of constrained to total variance um, or inertia is uh, R squared, your R squared value. And an R squared value of 6.42% is frankly pitiful. So this CCA was not uh, very informative. It wasn't successful in capturing the variability in vegetation composition in Bryce Canyon as a function of elevation slope and aspect value. Um, but we'll continue to use it for pedagogical purposes here. In the CCA, the inertia is the variance or spread of species scores. And here, um, the total amount is 10.86, as you see. What you can then do is you can look and see how much of that variance is um, um, explained in each axis. So here's our three axes here. Um, and what you can do is you can say take 0.5194 and you divide that by, remember these are the constrained axes, so the constrained amount of inertia here is 0.6976. So 0.5194 divided by 0.6976 is 74.4% of the constrained variance, meaning that that first axis explains the vast majority, but three quarters, of the constrained variance. But remember that the constrained variance is 6.42% of the total variance. So it's three quarters of a tiny chunk. Okay, 
In the online notes, I go over how you can examine how each site and each species contributes to the axes. And then also an ANOVA, how you can assess um, statistical significance of your model. In this case, for example, the model is highly significant, but that's likely due to sample size. I mean, look at the degrees of freedom, the residual degrees of freedom. So this illustrates how something can be statistically significant and yet have poor ecological significance. Only 6.42% of the total variability was captured in the CCA. Huh. Okay, now let's plot. A CCA ordination is a triplot where species are represented by red crosses, the sites are black circles, and the explanatory environmental variables are blue arrows. They're arrows because these variables were numerical and thus are vectors. Because these triplots are displaying a lot of data on a single plot, their interpretation can be challenging, especially if variables are correlated with each other. So let's go over this. The distances between objects in the plot indicate their similarity. So things that are, are near to each other are more similar to each other. The angles between the arrows represent correlations between them. And the direction of an arrow indicates the direction of maximum change in each. And arrow length indicates the importance of that environmental variable. So the position of points, of sight points, relative to the arrows indicates the environmental conditions at each site with respect to that variable, um, or the variables that you included, in our case, three. That's why we had three CCA axes, because we have three variables that we're, we're looking at here. Um, the locations of the species points relative to the arrows indicates characteristics um, of the ecological optima of each species. The arrows and the axes thus jointly reflect the composition of major environmental gradients in your data. So in this particular case, the first axis, your horizontal axis, is associated with increasing elevation because the elevation vector increases as you go from left to right. Whereas the second CCA axis, the vertical axis, is associated with decreasing slope and increasing aspect value. But of the three variables, notice in terms of, of arrow length, aspect value is the least influential of the three. In the online notes, I show you how you can use the identify function to see what these outermost sites were. So I wanted to know which sites were these that were sort of the most um, stretched on the plot. And so um, that's here. And so you can see it's sites 76, 137, and 138. And then what you can do is then examine those sites in, in greater detail. And you can do something similar with uh, specific species on the plot. You can also identify which sites contain a given species, like, for example, I, I picked a species that is given by the abbreviation of ARCPAT, which is Arctostaphylus patula, or the green-leafed manzanita, which is a type of shrub. And they're represented here by the, the sites that are now ringed in green. And you can see in this particular case how this species is affiliated with sites according to their slope, mostly low slope, here and in the interplay between slope and elevation. And they don't appear to be uh, much associated with aspect value. So this is how you interpret a CCA triplot. Every once in a while, every once in a great while, when you're doing a CCA, um, you might see something like this, where the sites form an arch, and that arch can be up or can be down. Um, an arch effect is not common in CCA. It's far more common in correspondence analysis, as is shown here in this graph. 
um, but an arch effect is indicative of poor fit. It appears similar to the horseshoe effect we talked about in the PCA lesson, and it is similar in terms of uh, the fact that both indicate that they're that the axes are not independent of each other, even though they're supposed to be. But the horseshoe is characterized by more of an inward curve at the ends. Regardless, seeing a bend in your plot indicates that your ordination is trash. Um, this is an example from correspondence analysis, as I said, where it is quite common. Um, but if you see something like this in your CCA and you rerun it, and include your variables plus your variables squared. And if you do that and the ratio between your constrained and unconstrained inertia improves, then that's a signal that you've got an arch effect somewhere in your data. So that, that means that there are explanatory factors that were not included in your analysis. And really, um, you need to do something about that. So this is rare, but you should keep it in mind. Up to now, we've examined numerical variables. Now let's add a text variable, a categorical variable of topographic position, which in the Bryce Canyon data set has five categories. And so you run it, as we did here, and it didn't improve things much. The ratio of constraint to total inertia is still trash, um, but it is better, which you would expect because adding more variables should uh, increase the amount of constrained inertia. Um, but even though it doesn't help us out a whole lot in terms of explaining the overall variation in the data, when you generate a plot with those uh, variables, it gives you a different perspective on the distribution of variability in the data. Um, in this triplot, each of the five topographic positions is shown with a blue X, which is a little bit hard to see in this plot. So there's one down here, for example, and that represents the centroid of that variable's uh, variability among sites. Um, in order to find out which X is which position, then you can use the summary um, here, and it tells you here's the five positions here. And what it means in our particular case is that plots on at, that are at the topographic bottom are relatively low on axis 1 and especially on axis 2. Ridge tops are higher on 1 and 2. And that given their signs, that bottoms and low slopes are qualitatively similar to each other mid-slopes and ridges are similar to each other, and upslopes are unique. Okay, so that's how you can include not just numeric data on a triplot, but you can also include um, categorical data as well. So now let's examine some published examples of how CCA has been used. This first study is by Terbrak and a colleague of his, and Terbrak is one of the big names in community ecology analyses. Um, this study actually is one that was done deliberately to illustrate the utility of CCA in ecology. In this study, they um, examined the aquatic macroinvertebrate community in two tributaries that are named L and U in the Netherlands that um, were similar in morphology, in stream morphology, but differed in their nutrient load as a result of differences in land use in the surrounding watersheds. They used electric conductivity as a proxy for nutrient load, which they assumed would differ with um, different land use. And the distribution of macroinvertebrates was examined with respect to hydraulic, uh, physical, and chemical variables. The sites are circles. You can see the, the L's and the U's here, the two sites. The species are triangles. And the environmental variables are arrows and squares here, the arrows being vectors and the squares being the categorical ones. <clears throat> 
so squares as opposed to X's like we had in, in our plots. The site labels, U and L, and their colors, the blue and orange, represent the stream designations. And the site numbers denote the ranked different ranked distance, excuse me, distance from the stream source. The um, black triangles of the species indicate the distribution optimum for each species, each one of these macroinvertebrates. Select species are displayed on the plot, not all of the ones that they um, surveyed. So if they included all the ones that they, they found, it would be a, a big mess. The distance between the site and the species position on this triplot is indicative of the abundance of that species at that site. And so, for example, uh, this species here, ET, is abundant in sites uh, U15, 16, 17, 18, 19, whereas, um, like, for example, this species up here, MS and SS and HD, they're more at sites L15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. For the quantitative variables, uh, quantitative environmental variables, the source distance uh, variable designates the distance of each site from the stream source, and the site ranking is consistent with um, the position, the direction of the arrow. The difference in species distributions between the L and the U sites is small near the stream source, the low ranks, but increases, increases progressively the farther from the source the sites are, um, or higher site ranks. And the relative positioning of the environmental variables in the species triangles indicates the optimum of species distributions along these environmental gradients. So, for example, for species uh, DL and ET here, the distribution optimum is located the farthest along the gradient of electric conductivity. A similar interpretation can be done for the categorical variables of the presence of shrubs or no shrubs, for example, and sites L15 through L20 have high shrub coverage. In this example, these researchers examined the bacterial communities at 14 wastewater treatment facilities in four cities in China. And their objective was to determine whether there was some kind of core microbial community um, in these wastewater treatment plants and to examine the effects of various environmental variables. Note first off that this is a biplot rather than a traditional CCA triplot. Uh, the dots are the sites and the arrows are the environmental variables. Um, there are seven environmental variables um, that are shown here that they measured. Um, chemical oxygen demand or COD, uh, SRT is solid retention time, there's conductivity, pH, TN is total nitrogen, DO is dissolved oxygen, and then there was water um, temperature. The length of these environmental arrows uh, in the ordination plot indicates the strength of the relationship of that parameter to community composition. And so you see that the arrows for temperature, conductivity, and pH are the longest, indicating that those are the most important environmental parameters explaining bacterial diversity among these wastewater treatment sites. The Qinghai Tibetan Plateau between Tibet and China is sometimes called the third pole of the earth because it is an area of extreme environmental conditions, just like the North Pole and the South Pole. It is the youngest, the highest, and the largest geomorphological feature in all of Eurasia, extending over two and a half million square kilometers. However, it is understudied, in part because of its great remoteness and its harsh conditions. And its altitude makes it very sensitive to the impact of global warming. It has a geographically unique flora and presumably a unique microbial community. 
these researchers did a basic description of the microbes of alpine meadows of the QT plateau. Note again that this is a biplot rather than a traditional CCA triplot. The dots are samples or sites. And the most important environmental variables are altitude, carbon, the carbon to nitrogen ratio, and lastly pH, soil pH, which uh, the shortest arrow is indicative of it not being very important at all. You can see that site SJYGH here was at the lowest altitude because it's the one that's farthest from the arrowhead, the altitude arrowhead. It was at an altitude of only 3,400 meters only. But, you know, this is the great mountainous region here. Um, whereas up here, this site, uh, YS, was at the highest altitude, 4813 meters. And you can see also that the communities of um, these four communities down here, DR, QML, uh, ZD, and CD, kind of cluster together. And they were separate from sites GH and uh, YS, indicative that there are perhaps three separate microbial communities present in the QT plateau. In this final example, the Three Gorges Dam is a hydroelectric dam on the Yangtze River in China. It was completed in 2012 and is the largest power station in the world. However, it has flooded um, significant archaeological and cultural sites, it displaced over a million people. It's been associated with increased erosion and increased risk of landslides. And it's had significant ecological impacts, including the extinction of the Chinese river dolphin. However, the effects of the dam on the bacterioplankton community are largely unknown. These researchers compared the community in the river downstream of the dam what are called riverine sites in these plots, um, from those from the lake created by the dam itself, which are called backwater sites in these plots. And they measured various environmental variables and found differences in the environment in the river versus in the lake, um, including in ammonium nitrogen, in nitrate nitrogen, um, in chemical oxygen demand, in temperature, and in um, uh, total phosphate, for example. Uh, in these two CCAs, the top one is of the bacterial OTUs, or operational taxonomic units or species, and then the bottom one is of gene activity. And these CCAs um, indicate that community composition was associated with nitrate nitrogen, uh, with ammonium nitrogen, with chemical oxygen demand, and with water temperature. Um, and that gene activity was similarly affected by environmental variables, but in slightly different ways, as opposed to the OTUs. And also, notice how the first two axes in both of these plots explain more than the recommended 60% of the total um, taxonomic information. These findings collectively indicate that there are distinct differences in the communities in the backwater in the river and that these are associated with environmental changes caused by the Three Gorges Dam. So for your assignment, you're going to be working with the grassland community data and the plot metadata, the site by species and site by environment uh, CSV files. And when you examine the plot metadata file, you'll see that there are uh, six variables in three types of data, which I've color coded here. Habitat and site, the blue ones, are text data. Um, and they're redundant since the habitat type and the site name are represented in each plot's name, actually. Uh, slope and aspect in orange are numerical data. And slope position and relative moisture in green are categorical data that are represented in words. Um, they could, in fact, have been represented as words. Like, for example, relative moisture has values of 1 to 3 that aren't real numbers in the real world. They represent dry, medium, and wet. Uh, 
And so instead of having 1, 2, and 3, they could have represented that as dry, medium, and wet. Because they are represented as numbers, R will treat them as such, even though they are not truly numeric data. So in your assignment, what you're going to do is you're going to do a CCA on the first two, um, the two true numeric variables of slope and aspect here and find out what the total variability is that was, would be explained by your CCA. Then you're going to do an ANOVA to examine the significance of the model and any of the variables and produce a, an ordination plot and interpret it. And what you can then do is go ahead and do a CCA on the two categorical variables in green. And you'll find that it'll explain more variability in the CCA that you did in Q1, and it will be statistically significant. And so this is an object lesson of some of the, the problems in dealing with R. R doesn't know that values of relative moisture of 1, 2, and 3 aren't really 3 is, you know, 3 times as great as 1 kind of thing. So anyway, um, play with it, and, and you'll see.